Welcome to Art Fellowship. Uh, tonight's topic is we just sang, I, I've decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. Even if no others go, I'll go. You know, which, so what's the theme of that? It's like having made my decision, I don't let anybody else, I don't let anyone else's behavior, I don't let anybody else's attitude, I don't let anybody else's bullying or anything have any say in my decision, my personal decision, to follow him come what may. Because if we are, as I think we mentioned last week, God doesn't call us sheep for nothing. We have a tendency to follow the rest of the sheep. So if the rest of the sheep start going wrong, it takes a certain amount of moral courage to let you know to try and stop them. And if they won't be stopped, you have to let them go, you know, because it's like no, no, I have decided to follow Jesus, not you know whatever they're chasing after. And this is going to be a problem for us more and more going ahead. So tonight is entitled. What is the real question of salvation? And how come it's only Jesus who can save? Because I was thinking about it, if you track everything, what do we need to know for the end times to, to, to stay safe? These are the two questions. If you can answer these things for yourself, you know, if you can have be armoured, armour plated with the truth about these things, then you should be reasonably unshakable. You know, you can still be shaken, but you won't fall over. You know what I mean? You should be fairly well armed against the influence of those who will unwittingly try and steal your faith from you. Okay, so first let's go to prayer. Father, we thank you. We bless you, Lord, for your word. We thank you. We have decided to follow Jesus. As of those who are watching in the Philippines, those, Lord, who are our family, one father, one family, Lord, we thank you for all that you have brought into covenant with you to redeem through the blood of your son, to rescue, Lord, by the fulfillment of your promise given through Jeremiah. We thank you, Lord, that you are God who does not change, that you are yourself. Nothing could be more important than that you are yourself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. With all this in mind, Lord, we pray now and ask for the help of your spirit, not only for me to speak the truth, but for those listening to hear it, Lord, for it to penetrate, for it to make the difference that needs to be made for all of us, so that no one will be lost, none will turn back, none will be deceived, none anywhere, Lord, not here, not Australia, not the Philippines, Indonesia, Japan, Africa, Lord, where we have brothers and sisters everywhere enduring all kinds of trials and being assaulted with all kinds of lies. Lord, we pray and ask that you would strengthen and empower them all by your spirit, Lord, to be armoured with the truth and unshakable in their faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so the first thing we need to look at is this. We're going to look at the first question first. There's a long idea. What is the real question of salvation? What is it we need to know most of all? So the scripture I want to look at in this regard, Matthew 24, starting in verse 9. So if you've got the handout that's on page 1 in the box. Jesus speaking, he says, Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. You will be hated by all nations because of me. It's going to pause there. It says, hated by all nations, right? you have to understand he's speaking to Jews, so they would take it that they'll be hated by anyone who's not a Jew. What does that mean for us? Remember, we are grafted into Israel. If you are in the covenant, you are grafted into Israel. So in God's eyes, you're a Jew. You're a real Jew. What does that mean? It means you're in covenant with him. I'll just see if I can quieten the construction site down. Because <laughs> I know the mic picks all that up. Sorry. So what he's saying there is, 
you who are in the covenant will be persecuted by those who are not. So the nations, the goyim, that's really how a Jew would have understood it. They saw themselves as the covenant people and the nations, those who are not Jewish, as the people who are outside of the covenant. That's how we should understand it, okay? Now, at that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. And because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will go cold. But the one who stands to the end will be saved. Now, we've done this a few times, so those words should be pretty familiar to you. If not, make sure they become familiar. It's important. But here's the one, I, verse 14, which we don't usually dwell on. I want you to take note of what it says next. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. So when I was first a believer in the Sallies, they used to preach on us a lot and to get us to evangelize because they'd zero in on that verse, 14, and say that Jesus won't come back. You guys will have had this the same. That Jesus won't come back until the gospel has reached the ends of the earth until the whole earth has heard the gospel and then he'll come back. So for centuries, the whole emphasis of mission work was really to hurry up and bring Jesus back. The faster we got the gospel to the ends of the earth, the faster Jesus would come back, based on that, right? And it's only when I was reading this the other day that I realised that I'd been a bit ripped off. Because they never mention the other stuff before. That whole thing is one message. It's not just verse 14, that Jesus will come back when everyone's heard the gospel. Otherwise, guess what? I think he'll probably be back. Between the internet and TV and better schooling and all this stuff. Do you really think there's anywhere on the planet, even the Eskimos, if you said Jesus Christ, they wouldn't know who you mean? Oh, even, in the, even in the Amazonian tribes and that, there's, yeah. unless there are tribes that no one knows they exist still. So, you know, the missionaries have been everywhere. So they didn't succeed everywhere. And not everyone's Christian. But it doesn't say when everyone's Christian. It says when this gospel has been preached to the ends of the earth. So in other words, no one anywhere has any excuse that they didn't hear. We can't be sure, but I would hazard a guess that probably that goal might be about as fulfilled as it's ever going to be in this modern, you know, thanks to technology and that. So people might reject Jesus, but they know who you mean. They might reject the gospel, but they know more or less what it is. You could argue that they maybe they've never heard the real gospel, they've just heard some you know, rubbish prosperity thing or something. How come Jesus isn't back? If that's what it means. Because that's how they used to teach it to me. You know? Well, because the other things have to be fulfilled as well. And as we look at what's happening in the world around us every day, every, every, almost every day's news has more something crazier and crazier and crazier by the minute, right? We need to look and see what about these other things. Because if we can understand what Jesus really means, he says all this has to happen. I can't come back until all this has happened. So let's just take it as, as we'll still keep evangelizing, but probably, probably verse 14 might be pretty close to fulfilled already. It's just these other things, right? But while the missionaries were out, where, where did most of the missionaries come from? Anyone know? Where did the vast majority of missionaries that went out to the world come from? 
Zealand. In the beginning, where? UK? Yes. Okay, they came from the Reformation. The Catholic Church tended to expand by conquest. So first he got Spanish soldiers, then he got Spanish priests, then he got Spanish school, and then you didn't really have any choice. You would be told that you are Catholic now. You know? But the first the first real appeal where it was, you know, an appeal where you were given like the truth in your own language and then it was up to you, what we would associate with like missionary work today. That really started with the Reformation and it mostly came out of what was known as the, the mission movement out of the United Kingdom. So who's heard of David Livingston? Very famous, he discovered the uh, um, Victoria Falls at the head of the Nile, all sorts of things like that. But he discovered it because he went further than anyone into the middle of Africa to evangelize, you know, whoever he met. And that's what they were like. These guys, they were driven by the idea that it was our duty to get the gospel everywhere, not just back home in comfortable England, you know, not just at home in comfortable Holland or France or whatever. So these mission societies grew up and that's how New Zealand began to be colonised. The Wellington was a church mission. You had the Wellington Company, right? But it was churches would take poor people who had no prospect in the UK, you know, poor, pa poor families. It cost 10 shillings to sail here. That's way they couldn't afford that. So the churches used to get converts and pay for their immigration to make a new start in New Zealand. When New Zealand was, you know, like just bush, basically, right at the beginning. So, you know, in back of all, all of these things, this missionary zeal to get the gospel to get christians to go to places where the gospel wasn't and take christianity with them and be an influence there because of this it's everywhere right so that's around that's in the 1800s but while they were all looking out you know so when you have that mindset you sort of think that well we don't need to evangelize england because england's christian we need to go to darkest Africa and, you know, scary Philippines and <laughs> whatever, you know? And because they're just these people living in the dark, not like us, so we need to take the light of the gospel there, right? The problem is, with all the emphasis on only evangelizing in those places, they didn't notice the enemy sneaking in the back door at home. And at the same time as all this was going on, something that started in the 1500s but really accelerated in the 1800s, the same time as the mission movement, was something called humanism. Right? So humanism is a philosophy. You get all kinds of human, all kinds of branches of humanism, but then it came into the church, especially through Germany. So all these German Lutheran priests and that began reading humanist philosophy and they started sticking Jesus stickers on it. You know, so they're taking something that's actually come from the world and then they change the language so it sounds Christian because it appealed to their intellectual thinking. Can anyone tell me what the basic doctrine of humanism is? I'll give you a clue, it's in the name. What what the humanists worship yes. humans. So the basic tenet of humanism is that humans are good and clever and wise and either individually and especially collectively we can do anything. Because we have brains, because we have science, because we can invent stuff. Right? 
How does it get into the church? What does it look like when it comes in the church? I'll tell you what it looks like. Just turn Hillsong on your TV. That's religious humanism that you're watching. Because Brian Houston's basic message is God loves you, but he wants you to be better. He wants you to be the best you you can be. Well, the best you you can be is a goal that's straight from humanism. You're already good, but you can be better. How? Well, study. You know, try stuff. You can do anything. We can do anything. Does this sound familiar from recent days? You know, the team of five million? That's humanism. That's what our government, that's the God of our government, is the same thing. That we don't need God, God, because we're God. You worship humanity. Where does Jesus fit in? When it comes in the church, where did they put Jesus? Same place as the likes of Brian Houston puts Jesus. He is the one who's going to help you be the best you. Jesus gets demoted from God Almighty, who you should fear and worship, you know, to like the hired help. You know, he's just there to help you reach your potential so that you can do what you want to, you know, so you can be, if you like playing guitar, Jesus will help you be the best guitar player. It sounds appealing to the flesh, right? <clears throat> but is it the gospel? Well, I guess you can already guess where I'm, what, what the answer is going to be. Of course, it's not the gospel. But it's taken over most of the churches, not just Hillsong, it's everywhere. It is everywhere, right? But one is God, we can't just say it's not the gospel if we don't have some evidence, right? So remembering that the basic belief is that humans are already good. And that if we try hard enough, nothing is impossible for us. And especially if we get together as a team, then we can solve anything. You know, we can conquer COVID-19 or whatever, right? Let's look and see what God says about us. And if we're on the bottom of page one, the box there, I, there's so many examples you could fill a phone book. But anyway, I just picked a few. Luke 18, verse 18, a certain ruler asked him, that's Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. What does he say next? No one is good except God alone. Outside of God, who's good? No one. My self-esteem's going down already. Romans 3, verse 20. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law, that means our rituals. Rather, that, rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. That means Jesus has been made known. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference anymore between Jew and Gentile, for how many have sinned? All have sinned. How many have fallen short? All fall short of the glory of God. And therefore all are only justified by his freely given grace through the redemption that comes by Christ Jesus. Important thing. Who are these clever people that the humanists imagine are there? According to God, they don't exist. Who is clever enough to not mean God? No one. From God's perspective, we are, you know, not quite guinea pigs. <laughs> but, you know, we're not the clever, we can do anything people that humanists think. And I'll explain that more in a sec. Let's read on. 1 John 1, verse 8. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. 
If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. John 15, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. Now he's talking about Christians, right? If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do how much? Nothing. Nothing. And Jeremiah, because of course I have to have an Old Testament one in there. Jeremiah 10, this is when he's praying to God. He says, Lord, I know that people's lives are not their own. It is not for them to direct their own steps. Discipline me, Lord, but only in due measure, not in your anger, or you will reduce me to nothing. What is God's basic message there to mankind? It's the exact opposite of the humanists. God isn't saying we're stupid. God isn't saying we are completely like a blob of jelly. What does he mean? He means you're not what the humanists think. Without me, you can't accomplish anything of significance. You know, you can plant crops, but if I don't send the rain, they won't grow. You know, you can. I won't go down that channel. I'm sure a thousand things will end up like sidetrack. Do you get what he's saying? He doesn't mean that you can't do anything at all. You know, you can still scratch your ear. You know, you can still walk to the mall and stand there staring into space. Lots of people are good at that. But you can't do anything of consequence of any real meaning apart from me. That's what he's saying. Why? When you're created and you're fallen and you're subject to sin and you think you're smart but you're not. You think you're wise but you're not because you're in the dark and you can only see a little bit. You can't see completely. You know? That's what he's saying to us. So he's not putting us down, it's a reality check. Does that make sense? It's not an insult. He's saying, get real. So when you have these churches that are there like, oh, you know, I'm a Christian, we're conquerors in Christ and nothing can stop us and I can do all things and blah, blah, blah. But what they mean is, I'm cool, I'm great. That's what they mean in their hearts. What do you think God's saying? He's saying, stop it, stop it, I'm going to die laughing. You know, wake up. Without me, no human being would even work out how to rub two sticks together to make fire. No. Not happening. Who knows... Who's heard of Job? Better known to you as Job, probably, but that's how you say his name in Hebrew, Job. Right? What happens to him? He's a righteous guy, right? He's really God-fearing, you know? And Satan challenges God. Take your protection away and let me have a go at him, and I bet he betrays you. God's like, no, he won't. Satan's like, yes, he will. So God says, okay, I will take my protection away and you can do whatever you like, but you're not allowed to kill him. You can hurt his things, but you can't, you can't, you're not allowed his life, right? So if you read the book of Job, it's just endless disaster, one after the other. It's just hell on earth for Job, right? And all the time, he's trying to stay faithful to God, and all the time, his friends, and particularly his wife, his biggest problem, actually, is his wife. His wife says, why won't you just give up on God and just die? <laughs> you know? She's so sick of it, she doesn't share his faithfulness. Neither do his friends. His friends start saying to him, oh, maybe God isn't good. You know, they start counseling him that maybe your trust in God isn't smart. 
maybe you're being a fool to put your hope in him because look at how he, you know, what he's doing to you. In the end, he cracks and he says, I'm sorry for the day of my birth. You know, I can't think of a reason for still living, but nevertheless, you, O oh God, are righteous. He accepts all the blame on himself. He can't understand why it's happening, but he just acknowledges it must be him. It can't be God. Right? Then God ends it. When he ends it, he has something to say to Job's wife and friends for their discouraging and faith undermining counsel. And look, it goes on for chapters, right? There's like five chapters, I think, that God just goes on and on and on. So I've just taken a little tiny snapshot from ver uh, chapter 38. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm and said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you will answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. You see what God's saying? You've been shaking your fist at me, you people, and thinking you're so clever, and thinking you can tell me what's right. Where were you when I created everything? Can you do that? What does Jesus say a bit like that? You can't, ad you can't add a day to your life or a hair to your head. Why do you think you can be God? You know, it's the same message. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footing set? Who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness. When I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place. When I said, this fire may come and no further. Here is where your proud waves hold. Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it? And God continues like this, like I say, for four or five chapters, endlessly challenging Job and his friends. You think you're clever? When did you ever do that? You think you're as good as me? When did you ever do this? You know? Because they presumed to think they were his equal and start to question him and start to argue with him about his motives and things like that, right? Well, that's exactly what humanism in the church does. It says, oh, no, if God was good, he wouldn't have a law like this. Therefore, even though it says that in the Bible, it can't be like that. It must be like this <clears throat> on a whole lot of subjects, right? What are they doing? They're telling God that he doesn't know his own business. They're telling God that they are cleverer than him. They're telling God that what he spoke through the prophets or even through his own son doesn't really cut it anymore. You know? Well, I'm wiser than you. So we're still going to be Christian, only now Christianity is going to mean something different. Because we're changing this bit, and we're changing this bit, and we're changing this bit. The more you observe in the modern times, the more you'll see that happen. Who saw the news about the guy in the pointy hat the other day? Who am I talking about? Francis. The Pope Francis. Did you see what he announced? He wants he wants same-sex civil unions to be accepted by the Catholic Church. So this is the head of the church, is openly said to the world's reporters, so even the church can't hide it because he spoke it to the secular world. As far as he's concerned, well, that this should be okay in the church. Based on what? 
Yeah, see? Yeah. But what's he just done? He's done exactly what God is having a go at Job's friends here. Who are you to counsel me? Did you create heaven and earth? You know, did you set the stars in their place? Who are you, little man, to say that what I've declared is not right? Because that's basically what he's done. And I'm just using him as an example because every single denomination, every single denomination right now, this is the kind of thing that's going on everywhere. And not just on LGBT, how many letters you want to add, issues, but on every issue. Here's one for you, because most of you were born after this became normal in the church. What does God say about divorce? There's no divorce, with one exception. But God said, it's not my law, but I permit it. <coughs> because otherwise it would be nuts. And that exception is if there's sexual immorality, sexual unfaithfulness, adultery, basically. Right. So if that goes on and it's unrepentant, then the per then the offended person has the right to end the marriage. Other than that, there is no divorce in Christianity. Period. Even in the New Testament, Jesus confirms it. Paul confirms it. Right. But what does the church say about divorce these days? What's your classic divorce these days? We don't really love them anymore. We used to have fun, but now we don't. I kind of like this other person more. So let's get a divorce. And you're like, yeah, let's get a divorce because, you know, you're just a grumpy old so-and-so, so good riddance, goodbye, right? What part of any of that, that's most divorces are like that, right? What part of that meets God's requirement? None, right? What does the church have to say when people divorce these days? Church people, I'm talking about. What does the church have to say these days? The answer is really easy. Nothing. Why? Because in the 60s, before you were born, they decided that God didn't really mean that anymore. Suddenly it was no longer a break with God's command to just divorce for any old reason. To the point that I'm not even, I don't know whether you even knew that God forbids divorce. Because your whole lives, it's as common as the rain. You know? It gets in slowly. But that's the process. It's humanism. Humans thinking, humans in the church, I'm talking about, humans thinking that they are smarter than God, that they understand things better than He does that his laws can be changed because they understand things better than he does. So yes, I know he wrote that, that's in the Bible, but, you know, it's the but. As soon as they do that, what have they done? They've challenged God's throne. They've said, we're God now. It's humanism with a Jesus sticker. That's your enemy. That's what you have to be so very careful because it's everywhere in the church already and it's growing and growing. And what happened with the Pope the other day is just but one of many examples of it accelerating. Things that even a short time ago, nobody would imagine was even conceivable at all. Especially like that example, you know? No one could conceive that the Catholic Church would suddenly make an announcement like that. Happened with the Sallies as well. Sallies used to be absolutely against that, same-sex marriage. Do you know what happened? They opposed it publicly. Everyone stopped giving money. What did they do? They changed their mind. They liked the money. Now they don't oppose it, and now it's got... It's gone from not opposing it to now they're promoting it. At least half of them are promoting it. It won't be long before it's official policy. See how it just gets in and gets in? It's deadly. It is 
deadly. What about man's cleverness? You know, what is what has God got to say about the fact that man does in fact do clever things? We have science, right? Who comes up with the scientific ideas? Humans, right? Aren't we clever? We must be a little bit clever to invent medicine and everything. But here's something I don't know whether you know. Why did the Jews exist biblically? What does God say to Abraham when he says, I'm going to make you a nation? Because remember, the Jews begin with an old man and an old lady, Abraham and Sarai, right? Who are already, you know, closer to 100 than 21. And he says to them, I'm going to make you a great nation, just the two of you, into a great nation. Can anyone remember what God's motivation, why he says I'm going to do it? Because he says, I want to reveal myself to those that don't know me. I'm going to show myself to the nations through you. Everything God does with the Jews is so that you and me see it. Everything God does with the Jews isn't just for the Jews. It's so that the nations see it and come to know him. Right? So going back to our science question, it applies there as well. You know... An easy test is the Nobel Prize, right? So if you do something super clever in human terms, they give you a Nobel Prize, right? So lots of Nobel Prizes go to American scientists. I'm just using the Americans as an example because I have the stats. So since the Nobel Prize was introduced until the current time, Jewish people are 3% of the American population. 3%, right? Tiny, right? Yet, 35% of all the Nobel Prizes ever won by American scientists are Jewish. And that statistic is pretty standard all around the world. <coughs> Maths, science, you name it. Even some dodgy things. Albert Einstein and Robert Oppenheimer, right? They invented the nuclear bomb. Both Jewish. You know? <coughs> Jewish scientists stand out head and shoulders above everybody else globally for being clever. By a mile. Is that because Jews are more clever? No, because they're his covenant people. It's God demonstrating what man with God is able to do. It's God revealing himself to the nations, as usual, through them. There's nothing genetically about being Jewish that gives you a better brain. You know? Their schools aren't any better than, well, they might be better than New Zealand schools, I shouldn't say that. But, but you know, there's nothing like sort of human about Jewish people that makes them exceptional in anything like that, and yet they are... <coughs> Yeah. Another case in point, when Saddam Hussein was firing missiles at Israel, you remember, the, oh, maybe you're not old enough to remember Desert Storm, when they first attacked Iraq, and the Americans and the British went there to get rid of Saddam Hussein. And so to try and draw Israel into the war, they were firing missiles at Tel Aviv and Jerusalem from out of Iraq, right? So the Americans rushed their very latest missiles to defend Israel that could shoot these Iraqi missiles down, right? The problem was, even though each missile cost a million dollars, it was supposed to be the best thing ever invented for doing this, they kept missing. The Americans were really, really upset because they'd spent billions of dollars developing it and they had boasted to everyone, Israel will be safe now because we've, we put these missiles there and no Iraqi missiles will get through. But they were having to fire three or four missiles at each Iraqi missile, like spend like four million bucks to shoot one 1960s-year-old Iraqi missile down. You know, 
Why am I sharing this? Well, eventually, the Israelis got sick of it. So without asking the Americans, they took the back off the computer that ran the launcher, and they had a look. And in five days, five days, they had worked out how it worked and why it didn't work. And then without telling the Americans, they just fixed it. And then no more Iraqi missiles got past one missile, one shot. Never missed anymore. And the Americans were like, wait, why, why aren't they missing anymore? And then the Israelis were like, um, well, we have, have to confess something. They got sick of them missing, so we fixed them. <laughs> you know, but this is the Americans had spent billions of dollars developing it with enormous companies, with hundreds of scientists, right, to develop something that missed. It took the Israelis five days to turn it into something that didn't miss. Once again, is that because, you know, the water's extra good in Tel Aviv, or, you know what I mean? No. It's God demonstrating that to protect his people, he can do anything. So up to now, what is it that we need to know? You can't do anything without the real God. You can't really keep yourself safe or defend yourself as a country. You can't even make your crops grow or anything. No matter how clever you think you are as a human race, without his help, all your science, all your millions of dollars, it's never enough. It won't work. Why is this relevant? Remember what we said in Matthew 24, we're on page 3 now. If we let ourselves, if we let ourselves be overtaken by that lie that is still creeping in the back door of every church, if we let our own thinking start to imagine that I don't need Jesus because I'm clever enough, you know, because I can work hard enough and I'm clever enough and I've got enough degrees or whatever, or I've got enough money or all this, what will happen? And that's what we're going to look at next. And the reason we have to look at it is because that stuff is creeping in everywhere, as we just were talking about. So it's going to try and creep into you and me. It's going to try and convince you that you don't need to be a Christian. You just need a good job. You don't need to be a Christian. You just need a degree. You don't need to be a Christian. You just need money or whatever. Right? Because we can do it. I can do it and we can do it. Just like Jacinda Ardern keeps saying all the time, team of five million, you know, we don't need God. We can do it. Make no mistake, that message is going to get louder and louder and louder. And if you still rely on God openly, they will increasingly hate you for not going along with the team. Remember what he said? The nations will hate you. Why? Because you won't be a team player. Because you won't be taken in by that lie. You'll be like a fly in the ointment, you know? You're this exception that doesn't go along. They won't like it. So for you to be able to stand, you need a reason. You need to understand why I shouldn't let my ego get puffed up like that. Why I shouldn't imagine for a moment that I can do anything apart from him of consequence. You know, I can do all sorts of meaningless things. Can't do anything of consequence without his help, without his presence. But let's go back to Matthew 24. 
And look and see what those things are that Jesus says have to happen. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Betray and hate each other. He's talking about inside the church. So the first thing we need to understand is most of our grief is going to come from false Christians. Your completely unsaved friends will probably just think you're a bit crazy but won't really bother you. In the same way as most of Jesus' trouble came from the Pharisees, not from the Romans. So the ones to be most careful of are people from belief systems that say they're Christian that you know are not. Many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. He keeps using this word many. Many who were of the faith will cease to be Christian. That word many is the word polis. And it means, what do you think it means, polis? It means a lot. Greek's a funny language. You know, to understand what each word precisely means depends on the context that you find it. So one word, one word can mean many things. But here, polis is meant to give the idea of more, more than half, you know, a whole lot. So this, Jesus isn't saying that, you know, this is going to happen a little bit there and a little bit there. He means it's going to happen massively. Many false prophets, it's the same word again. So we're not talking about a couple of false prophets, three or four. Polis, many. And if you look around the church globally, that's really happening. They're everywhere. New crazy people turn up like as if they're arriving by the bus line. What does that mean for us? Well, Jesus warns us it will happen. So A, we shouldn't be taken by surprise, but B, more particularly, we need to be really careful not to just jump on the bandwagon just because somebody's become the new hip prophet or whatever, because Jesus has warned us. Because wickedness increases, the word there is anomia, uh, anomia rather, sorry, it means lawlessness. Lawlessness means no law. How can I interpret no law? Well, it's like having no map, no moral compass. Someone who has no law, who's lawless, is an anything goes person. You know? It's Whatever. Society, Sorry? It's slowly dissolving. Yeah, yeah. So lawlessness is dissolving our society. You know, cancel culture, you heard that phrase? That's what cancel culture is about. That satanic attack on the foundations of your Christian society. Because the society you grew up in has Christian foundations. So cancel culture is actively trying to gel at night the foundations of your culture. That's why that's why that whole movement hates Christianity. It's because you've got rules. You've got moral standards. It can't stand that. Cancel those things. Cancel, cancel, cancel. <coughs> How does it do that? It says, oh it's racist or it's sexist or it's a something just you know? It just dreams up a label as an excuse to hate it. But what do they really hate? They hate any kind of limitation on their moral behavior. Their idea of freedom is to be able to do whatever their sinful nature wants. Yeah. Lawlessness. No law, no moral compass, no boundaries. No boundaries. If any of you end up working in social work ever, you'll find out what happens to people with no boundaries. They go nuts. They end up like so mentally damaged and lost and their behaviour becomes so self-destructive. So when you have kids, that's why you have to discipline them. Because discipline is establishing the boundaries for them. 
this is okay, this is not okay. So right up to here, after here, it's not all right. You know, that's what discipline is for. It's been, God says that he disciplines those he loves. These days, you know, the council culture people say, well, that doesn't sound right. Because they don't understand what discipline is meant for. Without law, you have no compass. You can't tell where good and evil stop and start. You're just adrift with no sense of up or down. <clears throat> what that does to the human psyche is catastrophic. And what it does to their behavior is scary. Very scary. Okay? It says, because of the increase of lawlessness, the agape, the love, remember agape is the kind of love that has to do with a willingness or a, a determination to obey. From John 14, we'll cover that again in a sec. Well, it goes cold. Actually in the Greek, where it says, you see there, it says the love of most goes cold. In the Greek, it's still that word polis. But it's just an example of where the context me was why they translate it as most because the context means it's still many but it's at the upper end of many so what's he saying most people who were christian will end up not christian when this process happens most people who say they're christian now will stop saying they're christian or there's one other option that will happen to them. They'll still say they're Christian, but they won't be. They'll be running after some total false prophet and a whole different gospel and a whole different Jesus. So they might still wear the Christian badge, but they won't be Christian, certainly not. Judgment, God won't accept them as Christian. That's scary. By understanding what the process is, how does that happen? Hopefully, we'll be able to guard our hearts against it. But these are the things Jesus says have to happen before he comes back. So there's no question we're going to see it. We're already seeing it. We can't imagine that it's not going to happen. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. The quicker we get our heads around the fact that it's no good praying, oh, Lord, please don't let it happen. That's like saying, oh, maybe you were wrong, Lord. No. It's horrible. I wrestle with this myself because if I could change it, I would. God knows that. But, he, he, you know, he just keeps saying to me, nothing you can do, Warren. It's not your fault. They brought it on themselves. You know, but when you want to save people, incidentally, can we save anyone? No, that's another thing on the list of, apart from me, you can do nothing. <laughs> so we are completely dependent on him for everything, everything. <clears throat> Let's continue down page three. So remember the question was, what is the real question of salvation? And why can only Jesus save? To help us answer the first one, we're going to look at that one to four there on page three. Have a look with me and we'll see what is just Jesus really just saying in Matthew 24. He's saying that many who once believed and who had faith and for whom the blood was shed and for whom the truth was revealed by grace. So that's everything, right? They will cease to be Christian. Why? Because their willingness to obey Jesus will go cold. So that's one saved, always saved, down the drain for a start. <clears throat> Why will they do that? Well, we'll see in a minute. But notice, if their love for him goes cold, dies, that's the end of their salvation. I'll show you why in a minute. Then Jesus has two things to blame. He says there's two agencies at work false workers who deceive and 
the, the catastrophic effect of losing any sense of right or wrong, losing any clear boundaries. The first one, the false teachers, are the cause of the second one. If you listen, I think we'll just pick on Brian Houston again because I started there. If you listen to one of his sermons, listen for what he doesn't say. You can listen for weeks, you will never hear him mention repentance or sin or consequences or the need to actually obey anything Jesus says. It's not there. It's these false teachings that slowly convince the bulk of the church that God himself doesn't care about his own word anymore. That God himself doesn't care whether you make any effort to obey him or not. That's the effect that false teachers have. They bring lawlessness in. Next one. The people end up with no fear of God. They become convinced that he doesn't even care about his law anymore. And in the end, they have no sense of where the solid ground is. Everything must be okay because God doesn't seem to care anymore. That's what the false teachers end up convincing them. And if they can't see where the solid ground is anymore, if they can't tell the difference between right and wrong, this is what happens. What's the point of being in church? if God doesn't care about sin anymore? What's the point of learning anything from the Bible if the law is gone? If anything goes, everything's acceptable. If Jesus just loves us and he doesn't care what you do anymore and everyone's going to heaven, etc., etc., and he just wants you to be the best you you could be in that kind of message. What do you need to read your Bible for? Because the Bible's full of the opposite message. You know, they'll, they'll say, they're already saying it. Well, you don't need that anymore because that's the old. You know, that's out now. That used to be, but not anymore. How does that person end up, really, in relation to God? Lost. They no longer will ever get to know the real God, the real Jesus, the real gospel. And if you can't think of a reason why I need to go to church, you won't. You won't. And I've met heaps of people that used to go to church, same church as me. Oh, you're still going to church? Oh, I know. Why? Oh, I don't know. Can't think of a reason to anymore. That's it. They just ran. I just couldn't think of a reason why they should. You know, because they're tired and it takes up half the morning on Sunday. And they just couldn't think of any compelling reason why they should bother. That's what false teachers do to people in the end. When you lose any sense of the law, of the need to be this, not that, consequences, that's what happens to them. They drift away, their love for him dies, goes cold. Jesus says the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Stands where? What does stand firm mean? Firmly on the solid ground. What is the solid ground? In the covenant on his terms. Shooting over to page four. So since that is so clearly what he meant, those who stand firm in me, in the covenant, and will not be shifted, we better know what the covenant is, right? So on page four, I've taken an, an excerpt from the actual covenant when God gives it, which is in Jeremiah 31. Hear me, Yahu Hanavi, Jeremiah the prophet. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. 
So he's talking about the covenant Jesus brings in. Let's see what he promises to do. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. Remember what we've been doing for weeks now about the difference between it, the word in you and just external appearances? He promises the new covenant, the law. Which law? Who's he speaking to? Jeremiah. Where's this? Old Testament. He says, the law. Which law? The Old Testament law. The New Testament covenant, he promises that the Old Testament law he'll write in our hearts and press it upon our minds. He'll take the law and put it in us. So remember the, the problem in the end is lawlessness. What's the first thing you can say about those who are in the covenant with him? Can you be lawless and be in the covenant? No. Because the first and most important thing of the covenant is that the law of God is in you. If you are lawless, if you've lost the law, you've lost the covenant. The most important part of the covenant is not there in you. You understand? That's why Jesus talks about people who become lawless at dying. They're outside of the covenant. They're outside of salvation. What else? He's, he will personally... Uh, sorry, back to you. I will be their God and they will be my people. That's from Exodus 6. That's one of the promises he made the original Passover. I'll be your God and you'll be my people. What's he saying about that? He's saying I'm going to make this personal. Your relationship won't be with the church, won't be with a priest, won't be with a pope or a, you know, Archbishop of Canterbury or anybody. Your relationship will be with me. I will be your God. You will be my people. You know? That's the promise of the new covenant. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me. All means all in the covenant, right? How does, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, how does that happen? How come those who are in this new covenant don't need anyone to tell them that Jesus is Lord. What does he say? No longer will they teach their neighbour. Why? Because he promises to teach us himself. I myself will teach them. I will write my law. I will put it in them. They will all know me. How will they all know you? What has God put in you when you're in the new covenant? What goes into you that you didn't have before? Starts with a capital S. The Holy Spirit. That's why no one needs to tell you that Jesus is Lord when you are really in the covenant. God himself tells you. You don't have to trust another human being that it's true. When you're really in the covenant, you know directly from God that he's gone. But this is way back in the Old Testament, right? The thing is, he, we can't get past that first part. He writes his Old Testament law in us. The law is critical for New Testament Christians. We're lawless, we're not Christian, because the law has to be in us if we are Christian. What else do we need to know there? Oh, yeah, and then the final promise. What's the point of all this? What's the benefit for those who are in this covenant? There it is in bold. For I will forgive their wickedness, 
and I will remember their sins no more. What's a, which is the most important of those two things for your head, for your peace of mind? Which is the most important? It's the second one. If you have done something and you repent, God has forgiven you. Any Christian can be a witness for Christ and confirm, yes, you are forgiven, right? What often happens, though, is yep, you know you're forgiven, but you can't forget what you did. It keeps coming back and haunting you. Even though you know you're forgiven, it keeps coming back and haunting you. But God doesn't just promise to forgive. He promises to forget. I will remember your sin no more. God will give himself a case of deliberate amnesia about your sin. So when you see him face to face on Judgment Day, if you are really a Christian, he will have deliberately caused himself to forget every wicked thing you ever did. He will see you like his son, sinless, as if you'd never sinned. So it's a very important promise of, of the covenant to remember for all of us because we should have the same attitude. If we know we've been forgiven, put it out of mind. God has. God has. So we know to be lawless is to be outside of the covenant because to be in covenant, the law has to be written in you. What then is the real question of salvation? Grace? Faith? <laughs> oh yeah, grace, faith. <laughs> to be holy. <laughs> you know, all those things are components, but the big question, the granddaddy of them all, the thing that makes the difference, and the thing that really is you have to be able to answer yes, and those things are just the building blocks of it, is this. Are you in the covenant on his terms? The actual covenant. He didn't have to forgive us. How does grace work? Grace meant charis, right? It means a gift. So he gives us an opportunity we don't deserve, but it's just an opportunity. It's not salvation itself. By grace, you come to know of a way out of otherwise doom. Remember the default state of creation is condemnation? So as a gift, grace, grace, <laughs> he, he provides, he shows you the door, the narrow way. He says, everything's doomed, but I've made a way out. It's not very big, but you can fit through it. You know? But there's rules. That's why there has to be faith. But you know that's pistis, meaning not just believing, but acting on the belief. How do you know what's the right thing to do? Oh, that's right. That's in the covenant. I'll write my law in you. How do you know it's not okay to murder? Because you read it in the Bible? Even if you didn't read it in the Bible, every Christian knows. Why? Because it's the law. God has written his law in your hearts and in your minds. The conviction of the Holy Spirit is the law alive in you. Understand? You can't be in the covenant on your own terms. You can't rewrite the covenant to suit yourself. Like the Pope's trying to do. Oh, that bit doesn't suit us. We'll just rewrite it. No, you don't get to do that. Remember what God was saying to Job? Where were you when I created the heavens and the earth, you bright young thing? You know, clever boy rewriting my law. I should take lessons from you. No. You understand? He has given us a narrow way out on his terms. His terms. One he didn't have to give us, that's why it's grace. A gift. 
but it's a conditional case. Amen? If we listen to the false teachers, if we allow lawlessness to creep in the back door and rob us of our moral compass, rob us of the knowledge of right and wrong, rob us of God's instruction to where we just think that, oh, well, it's by grace and God just forgives everyone and he doesn't even care about his law anymore, so we can just do whatever and we're all going to heaven. You get like that, the law will depart from you. You have departed from the covenant. You are no longer there on his terms. You're dead. Outside the covenant equals dead. Going to hell. That's why from God's perspective, successful false teachers are like mass murderers. You know, people that get like millions of followers even though they're completely false. Well, what are they succeeding in doing? They're succeeding in leading people away from the real Jesus to die, to be without life. False teachers are mass murderers in a spiritual sense. So if I get occasionally angry at them, don't be surprised. So that's the answer to our first question. What is the real salvation question? Is that, are you... In the covenant, the real covenant, on his terms. That's all you need to be able to say yes to that. Then everything else you've learned is really just the building blocks to be able to know whether the answer is yes or no. And if it's no, work out why it's no, fix it. You know, if you realize you're listening to the wrong thing or whatever, fix it. God always requires was always seeking our repentance, remember? So that's the granddaddy question that we need always to be able to answer yes, especially in the times we live in, because all of that stuff is trying to creep in the back door constantly. Page five. Just to reinforce it, John 14, Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. Is that unclear? It's not, is it? So if people say, oh, no, no, it's not about obedience, well, so you're calling Jesus a liar then. Plain as day, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we, plural, will come to them and make our home with them. How do you do that? The Holy Spirit. If you're not interested in obeying his teaching, don't expect to be spiritual. Because of what it says next. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. If you read the rest of that, it promises that you will not have the Holy Spirit. That's really straightforward, isn't it? And remember what we've been learning. This is not about being perfect. This is like Paul, remember? I do the things I hate and I hate the things I do. Who can deliver me from the, this body of death? You're not going to get a 100% mark for actual achievement. This is about those who are earnest and seeking to be. It's their goal to be holy, their goal to be perfectly obedient, balanced by the fact that in this life, at least, we know we'll always fall short. But God isn't stupid. He can tell the difference between someone who wants to be obedient and someone who really doesn't care. The one that loves me will try and obey my command. The one that doesn't love me, why bother? Couldn't be plainer. Absolutely plain. Matthew 5, verse 17. Do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Now that you know what the covenant actually says, does that make sense now? Why would Jesus not come to abolish the law? Because the whole point of the covenant is that very law is what God promises to write on our hearts and minds. He can't write it on our hearts and minds if he's cancelling it, can he? You understand? The law hasn't gone anywhere other than he no longer wants to just have it in a book. He wants it in you. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. 
Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commandments and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, well, let's just pause there for a sec. What has he just said? Nobody probably has the knowledge of the gospel 100% right, I include myself, right? What's he saying there? If we deliberately teach something wrong, does that mean you're automatically out? Probably not according to this. But you'll certainly be less in the kingdom. But there is a cutoff point. There is a point where you've gone too far as a false teacher. So he says you're blessed if you keep the commands. You're not blessed if you start trying to change them or cancel them. Right? But you might still be saved. But then there's a point where it's too far, where you've gone too far with false teaching because of what he says next. I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom. What does certainly not mean? Is there any room for wriggle there? No. So our righteousness has to surpass that of the Pharisees. Easy, right? Except what does that mean? Let's find out. The chaosune is the Greek word for righteousness. And you don't have to memorize that. But what it basically means is divine justice. Divine. So we've got grace, holy, faith, and divine. Oh, two. We've got two divine. Wow. So we should be right. Okay, hang out with these guys. Okay, so... What does it mean? Righteousness, divine justice, how does that work? It means this. Divine means of God, right? Not of man, of God. Justice, what is justice? Justice is the absolute correct rule of what is right and what is wrong. So translating it into modern English, you would say righteousness is holding to what God, divine, says is right, justice. So not what man says is right, what God says is right. Recognizing the authority of God to be the only one who has the right to say this is okay and this isn't. If man wants to disagree, that's an opinion. When God says it, that's a fact. You understand? The righteousness of God is that which is absolutely right. Not, you know, oh, that's your opinion, I have a different opinion. No, in an absolute sense, unchanging, eternal sense. Forever right, forever wrong. That's God's righteousness. That's what righteousness means. And he's saying that unless our righteousness, so in other words, unless our sense of right and wrong, what's divinely right or wrong, is better than the Pharisees, then you'll never enter the kingdom. So shouldn't we know what the deal with the Pharisees is? Let's have a look at middle of page five. Let's have a look at these Pharisees and we'll see what their sin is. Once you see this, it'll be hopefully you'll see it straight away. Jesus replied, why do, you, why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? So there's the first clue. What are the Pharisees doing? They know what God has commanded, but they don't do it. Why? Well, they've got another tradition. What have they just done? It's that humanist thing. They've put their thinking in a higher place than God's thinking. We know better. Our tradition is more important than your word. For God said, honour your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father and mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God, they are not, uh, 
they are not to honour their father or mother with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. Just to explain that, the Pharisees, you know like a prosperity church? Where they emphasise tithing? And they'll make everything hang on tithing? Well, that's kind of what the Pharisees were saying. God commanded that you should use your money to take care of your parents. You know, when they're old, so just as when you're Zachariah, who you can't help himself, he relies on the parents to spend their money to look after him. But at the other end of the timeline, the roles reverse. Now it's the parent who's the baby, who, who needs the child to spend their money to look after them in the same way they were looked after when they were from. You understand that? That's, that's God's law, right? What the Pharisees were saying is, oh, no, 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 you have to prioritise tithing. You have to prioritise giving money in the temple. So even if your parents starve, you have to prioritise giving money to, guess who? The Pharisees. Just like those prosperity churches, but they do the same. They'll tell people who are poor and starving, who need every penny to feed their kids, that to get God's blessing, you need to take that little money that you've got and give it to us. Then God will bless you. Absolute garbage. It's the same thing, right? But what Jesus is saying is, you are obliterating God's command in favour of something you've made up to suit yourself. Then he says, you hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, Isaiah 29, verse 13. These people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Remember what righteousness means? Establishing that which is absolutely right according to God. What's the Pharisees' problem? They're the opposite of that. They are, they are telling everybody what's right and wrong, not based on God, based on themselves. Based on human thinking. They obliterate the scripture to bring in different rules they made up. See? Just like the example we were giving before about suddenly maybe the church will say that, oh, okay, so maybe same-sex Unions are suddenly okay with God. Who made that brawl up? Not God. Them. It's exactly the same process, right? What does God call them? Hypocrites. That's what Jesus is saying. Your righteousness, so your handle on what's right, must be better than the Pharisees. Do you get what that would be now? It's easy, isn't it? It needs to be based on what God said, not on what man said. Even if the man wears a big pointy hat. You know, even if the man is has a church of 20,000 people in some massive, you know, TV show or something. If he teaches something that disagrees with what God has said, if you listen to that instead of God, you are no better than the Pharisees you will certainly not enter the kingdom. Certainly not. That's scary. It's not me saying that. It's Jesus of Nazareth saying that. See, it's really the same message as before. If you throw the law out of your heart and replace it with something made up by men, humanism, you will certainly not enter the kingdom. Remember we had a song we sung at the beginning? I've decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. Even if no one else is going. That's what this means. You can't have you can't successfully serve two masters. You can't follow two shepherds. You're either following him or you're following someone who's taking you to hell. Rules made up by men, gospels made up by men and demons don't have anything to do with them. 
What else we need to know on page five? Just the conclusion at the bottom, therefore study to know what God has really said, his word, and internalize that because it needs to be in you. Because that's what the Holy Spirit will actually help you with. And it's a covenant promise. You don't have to beg him for help. That's why he's here, to do that. So the more you study what God has actually said and take it in and make it the righteousness in you, the law in you, the more you are assured that come what may, you're going to be in the kingdom. And remember, as I've said at the bottom, it's not enough to believe in God. It's not enough to believe in Jesus. You have to believe God. When he says believe, he means believe him, not just believe in him. If people, if you find yourself saying that to someone, what's the easiest way of explaining why it why it's, makes a difference? If all I had to do was believe in Jesus, to believe that he's the son of God, why isn't that enough? What's that? Even Satan, even the demons know that and tremble, as James says. Right? So just believing in Jesus only puts you on a par with demons. They believe in him as well. But they don't believe him. They don't bow down and follow him. That's the difference. Let's go over to page six. Which brings us to the issue we're just talking about, the difference in the two kinds of believing. Lots of people from Reformed churches have been told that, oh, you remember King's Arms? What's his name? He always used to jump up at the end. He'd always say, thank, thank goodness that salvation is by grace through faith. Free gift of God. Remember? He used to say it every time. I remember his name now. He used to say at the end of the thing, and God would always convict me that it's a dangerous person. And I'm, why, Lord, what's he saying? And then I realized what he was saying. That that's, where, that's it. It's just a free gift. So long as you believe in Jesus, you're saved. Believe in him. A free gift. That's not true. Even Satan believes in him. They get it from Romans 3. The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. But they think believe just means believe that he's the Messiah. They're reading it out of context. It doesn't mean that. It means who believe him, who believe his testimony. And it's Jesus himself saying, your righteousness has to be greater than the Pharisees. The law in you has to be my father's law. You have to live by it. It's not just, I believe, therefore I'm saved. But that's what they think, right? That's why God was kept convicting me, this guy is dangerous. Right? It's not enough to believe in. What does that mean there? Let's have a look at it. Romans 3, this righteousness, that's God's righteousness, in other words, where God will consider you righteous because the law in you is his, is given how? Through faith. That word is pistis. So it's not just knowing, it's acting on it. You know? So it's not passive, it's an activity. It's a verb, right? Faith in Jesus Christ. So you don't just believe in him, you believe him. The evidence that you believe him is to set out to do what he says. Action. To all who believe. Why? Believe what he said. Believe his testimony. Believe his commands. You see, when you read it properly, it's completely consistent with everything else we just read. It's only when you take it out as like a sound bite and read it by itself in English that you can be suckered into thinking that all you have to do is believe that he's the Messiah, confess him with your mouth, and I'll be saved, regardless of the fact that I'm lawless. My whole life is not Christian. No? I hate to think of the number of people who are going to turn up on Judgment Day and find out what a big mistake that was. Remember what Jesus says in Matthew 7? Many will come in that day 
saying, Lord, Lord, look at all the things you've done in your name. And he says to them, go away from me, I don't know you. You have nothing to do with me. That's serious. Let's... We need to do what? Ah. So let's look at... In the, book, in the box in the middle, let's have a quick look at this idea of God crediting you, in other words, acknowledging you as righteous. And what righteous means? Divinely just, right? Or holding to divine justice. And the best place to look is the same place that Paul went looking, Genesis 15. And here, who is Abraham? In Hebrew is Abraham, right? Who is Abraham? Abraham, correct. Why doesn't it say Abraham? That's right. God gave him a new name. When did he give him a new name? Something happened. He gave him a covenant promise. He says, from now on, your name is Abraham. And Sarai became Sarah. Right? Because it's a, a rum, you know that this is right at the beginning of the process. Right? God is just beginning to start to deliver his promise. Look at this. A rum believed the Lord. Not believed in the Lord. He believed the Lord. He believed what God had said. And he credited it to him as righteousness God credited to him as righteousness what happened as soon as Ab we'll call him Abraham as soon as Abraham in his heart determined that everything that God had said was true and therefore he would live his life by it that means he took the word that he heard outside of himself and he took it in and he made it the law in his heart. Abraham said, I believe what you have said, therefore I will direct my path by what you have said. God accredited that to him, in other words, acknowledged him as righteous. God treated this man as righteous when he believed what God had said and set out to live by it. That's what it means. Abraham had not done anything yet, no works yet. Neither had God done any of the fulfilling. It's where he had taken what God had said, believed it, and written it in himself, made it the rule in his heart. That's the kind of belief that God will ascribe to a person that that person is righteous in his sight. The person who has his law, what he has said, is the rule in their heart. Does that make sense? And particularly, since it's our topic, not the rule made up by some man. Not like the Pharisees, you know? The righteous, according to God, are those who have his law in their hearts and set out to live by it in practice to be followers of the Son. What does Paul have to say? He, he picks up the same thing in Romans 4. What shall we say uh, what then should we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about. But not before God. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God. That's the one we're just reading. And it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. People read that in English and they go, what are you going? You're probably going, what does that mean? So, let me explain. God doesn't owe you anything. No matter how much you do for him, he doesn't, the, the debt balance never goes in your favour. 
You cannot repay what God has already spent on you, the blood of his own son, right? And any righteous thing you do and anything great that you do, whose credit is it? What can you do apart from him? Nothing. So for what will you earn brownie points? None. Every righteous thing, every great thing a Christian accomplishes is accomplished by the Spirit working through you. You understand? So the, what we earn, the reward for our faith, is a gift. Because anything good we ever do, he did it. In us, through us, or to us. You understand? Abraham was the same. What could Abraham do? Or his wife? He's ancient, she's ancient, and barren. God says, I'm going to make you into a great nation. They haven't got one child, never mind millions. He says, your descendants are going to be more than the stars in the sky, more than the grains of sand on the beach. Imagine it. You're like, you know, probably more than 100 years old. And God says, you're going to have so many descendants. You and your wife. Huh. But he believed God. That's a critical thing. He understood that in his own strength, that was impossible to bring about. It's like your salvation. In your own strength, it is impossible to bring about. But he believed that if God said it will be so, then it will. Because nothing is impossible for God. You know? Does that make sense? So what he's saying, what Paul's saying in here is that the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. So if you were earning heaven because God owed it to you, it wouldn't be a gift. It wouldn't be grace. But as it is, it is grace. Because the what you will receive comes not because God owes it to you, but because he counts you righteous. Because you believed him. And therefore you set out to do those things because you believed him. Not to earn them, but simply because you believed him and therefore you set out to put what you believed into action. He gives the kingdom grace to such as these just as he fulfilled his promise to Abraham. Not because of what Abraham did. God never owed Abraham anything. You have to understand there's two kinds of covenant. There's a covenant that's conditional in both directions and there's the covenant that sometimes God declares things in his own name by himself that has no condition based on man. He says, I will. That's it. Period. So that's the kind of covenant God made with Abraham. I will make you a great nation. Full stop. Nothing of you, everything of God. I will do it. It's different than the salvation covenant, which is conditional on our response. So there's two kinds of covenants, right? Do you understand this faith business now? What it means to believe, it's not believe in him. Like Abraham, believe what God said. Even if it seems impossible to you. How could I be saved? You'll, sooner or later you'll find yourself saying that. If you haven't said it already. You'll look in the mirror and you go, how can I ever get to heaven? How can I ever be good enough to get to heaven? Well, you can't. No one can be good enough to get to heaven. That's not how you get there. Faith. Faithfulness. Knowing you're a sinner and setting out, believing what Jesus has said, believing the promise God made in Jeremiah. You set out to be a law keeper. Moral. You know? Do what God loves, do that. What God hates, don't do that. What God has said, echo that. What God has forbidden, Echo that. Say no. You know? Reflect him. Why? Because you believe what he has said. Even if the crowd don't. 
even if the Pharisees are running the church, and even if the humanists are, you know, screaming at you to follow them. It's like, no, like our song, I've decided to follow Jesus. That means his law needs to be the law in here. I believe what he said, therefore I'll set out to do it. That person is the one God calls righteous. To them, that opportunity will not have been in vain. Last part now, try to go a bit faster. How come it's only Jesus that can save? Mark 2, verse 6. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This, avail, this amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. The scripture there calls Jesus the Son of Man. Sometimes it says, calls him the Son of God. This is the rule you need to understand. Both titles apply to him. Which one they use depends on who he's identifying with. If he described as the son of man whatever he's doing in that moment he's identifying with humanity remember he's 100% God and 100% human so when it says son of man he's identifying with us when it says son of God he's identifying with the father in this case he's identifying with that crippled man he wants him to know that the son of man God identifying with his creation has authority on earth to forgive sins. But you notice when the Pharisee said, no one but God can forgive sin, does Jesus say they're wrong? No. He doesn't correct them. Why doesn't he correct them? Because they're right. If they were wrong, he would have said so. But they're not wrong. Only God can forgive sin. And I put it to you like this. If you own the bank, let's say ANZ, if you owe the bank a thousand dollars and one of your friends that works at ANZ says to you, oh, don't worry about it, just don't, don't bother paying that back. Are you actually out of debt now? Why? The answer is no. Why are you not out of debt? Well, even though your friend works at the bank, it's not your friend you owe the money to. The golden rule is the only one that can forgive the debt is the one that the debt is owed to. So either God himself, because the debt you owe is a debt under the law. You owe your life, remember? The only one that can forgive it is God himself or someone that he gives 100% of his authority to speak in his name with his full authority to either cancel or not cancel the debt on his behalf. There's only one person ever that has that authority. Who's that? His own son. Why? Because he's part of the Trinity. We owe the debt to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He doesn't just speak for the Father. He's Echad, remember, with the Father. He's part of the Trinity. Only Jesus can declare the dead forgiven. What about Christians? When we say, oh, your God forgives you, do we have authority to do that? Important question. Do we have the authority to do that? Someone comes and confesses something to you, but then they repent. 
you know, and you counsel them and then they do what's right in the sight of God, are you allowed to say, your sins are forgiven you? Do you have authority to do that? It's a trick question because I've said in there, if they confess and repent and do what's right in the sight of God, He forgives them according to his promise. Therefore, we as the witnesses have authority to confirm what's already happened. He does the forgiving, but we have authority as the witnesses to confirm on the authority of the word that your sins are forgiven you. You understand? So you yourself cannot just willy-nilly say, oh well, that's okay, you're forgiven. If they haven't repented, if they haven't done what God requires about that sin, then you don't have authority to forgive them. You're only a witness. You're like the guy from the bank that says, nah, don't worry about paying that back. You don't have authority to cancel that debt. But if the person has done what God requires to be forgiven, and they say, do you think God has forgiven me? If you know that they've done what God requires, then yes you have authority, the authority of the word, to confirm it. Does that make sense? It's really important to understand. So to have forgiveness, a person has to do what God says you need to do to be forgiven. Confess, repent, go to return to his way. If you've done that, Jesus forgives you. So if you see that the person has done that, you're able to confirm it as the witness, Jesus forgives you. If they won't repent, if they won't do what God says, you have the authority to say your sin remains. You're still in trouble with God. It won't go away until you do what he says. Do you understand? We can only confirm what Jesus has already said. You're not able to just forgive sins on your own authority. Anyway, I didn't mean to spend that much time on that. John 5. So that's the first thing. Only God can forgive sin. And Jesus being a cub of the Father, that means he can do it. No one else. John 5 verse 21. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honour the Son as they honour the Father. Whoever does not honour the Son does not honour the Father who sent him. Problem for Jehovah's Witness, who say that Jesus is not God's Son. Right? They don't honour the Son, they don't honour the Father. They're in big trouble. But John 2, Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. Note what it says next. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. How much does God need your help to see that a sinner is a sinner? No. It's very important. When, you, when you're praying for someone, or never, never go to God as if he doesn't already know. Because if you've seen sin in them, you're, you're catching up. God has seen sin in them from the beginning. Remember, nothing's hidden from him. Jesus doesn't need anybody's help to know what's really in a person. It says there, he gives life to whoever he is pleased to give it to. Who do you think he's pleased to give it to? Those are in the covenant. Those who are walking according to his instruction. If someone like Abraham believes God and sets out to do it, he is pleased to give that person salvation. They've really come into the covenant on God's terms. But what the scripture says there is God has entrusted everything to Jesus and Jesus has the right to give life to whoever he's pleased to give it to him. And he needs no help to know what's really in a person. He doesn't make mistakes. 
what does that mean for us? If we can look in the mirror and see a Christian looking back on God's terms, you can be certain. You can be certain that Jesus is giving you life. He is pleased to give it to those who have believed God's testimony and have determined in their hearts to live by that. I think we can go... Uh, are we done? Okay, so the answer to our second question, how come only Jesus can save, is that only the person to whom the debt is owed has the right to cancel it. The debt under the law is owed to God. God alone can cancel it. God entrusted everything to his son. That means only the son will cancel it for those who have done what God asked. No one on earth, no human being, just him. He, did he cancel the law? No, we already saw that he didn't. So how does Jesus get to cancel what the law requires? How does he cancel the debt? You know this. How does he get to cancel the debt? He doesn't write the debt off, he pays it for you. That's what he did on the cross. He's righteous, remember? He won't break his own law. He says, okay, I, I excuse you from the debt, but someone still has to pay it, so I'll pay it for you. So he hung on the cross and gave his life instead of you. You know, he substituted himself to pay the debt the law requires for your sin, he took your sin on himself and paid it on your behalf. So he doesn't just forgive your sin as if it didn't happen. He satisfies the law because the law is still the law. He suffered instead of you the consequences of your sin. No one else hung on the cross. No one else is God's son. No one else has a right to cancel the debt. Jesus alone. And not any Jesus, only he who is really the Son of God, who keeps the law, he doesn't throw it out. So those are the two questions. Ten minutes late, sorry about that. But those are the two questions that I think are, re are central to us holding firm in the days ahead because we will see those wicked things increase and increase and increase around us in society and in the church. Hold to these things. Make sure you understand them and hold to them personally. You'll be safe. You won't be led astray. You won't be calmed. So Father, we thank you for your word. We pray and ask, Lord, that you give us your Holy Spirit even more to write your law, your law, not the rules of men, not anything according to humanists or any bright person who thinks they are equal, but your law, what you have said through your prophets, through your son and through his apostles. Write that law in our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, by the finger of God. Convict us day and night, Lord, of what is right, your righteousness, so that we can not just believe in you, but believe you, Lord, and be guided and shepherded and led out of the darkness, walking in the light of your instruction, to be counted righteous in your sight, that you might be pleased to give us life abundantly, not only forgiving our sins, but afterwards, Lord, to inherit with you the kingdom which is to come. By your grace, not that we have earned anything, nor that you could ever be in our debt, but we ask these things, Lord, that your name be glorified and your covenant kept concerning us. In your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Okay, good night. Shalom.